Hello and welcome to News Click. Today in Talking Science and Tech, we are joined by Prabhu Prakashta. So, Prabhu, we see that uh, in the last few days, fa- past couple of weeks, China has made varied tech advancements. We saw that the Chinese moon lander just came back and it returned with the first moon samples in 44 years. Then Chinese scientists also fired up their artificial sun nuclear fusion reactor successfully for the first time. But what we want to talk about today is uh, the Chinese quantum computer, which is which has achieved. quantum supremacy becoming only the second computer ever to do so but before we get into how it was done can you you know explain to our viewers what quantum supremacy is why is this so significant without getting into what is a quantum computer and we'll do that just in a little what it is the quantum supremacy means that a computer based on quantum principles can do calculations which a classical computer the computer that we all know which is what we used in our lives that cannot do so this is the quantum supremacy issue that it can calculate in a finite time something which will take a classical computer much longer then the what is a quantum computer of course becomes a second issue therefore that unlike classical computers which have only two states zero or one it's either a bit is on or off and that's the basis of our com- computing as you know it's a series of zeros and ones we use and they can be converted into the numbers that we want at the end of it but the computer really has every bit of it has two states so that's a bistable state so to say so that's why we have binary arithmetic inside the computer while what we write programs can use our numbers but it converts for the computer everything into a binary system a quantum computer works on the basis of what are called qubits quantum bits which means that the same bit can have multiple states it can have a combination of zero one as it were and this is difficult for a, us to understand what do i mean by uh, a st- bit being in two states or a combination of two states so this is something that comes from quantum mechanics and we are not going to try and understand it today all we need to know is that it the same bit can exist in multiple states simultaneously and therefore the quantum computer as you pile up q bits is capable of computing much larger uh, numbers and uh, much larger combinations than what a classical computer can do therefore certain kind of maths it can do which a classical computer cannot do and therefore it would solve a certain class of problems that classical computers would take eons to solve that's the basis of this whole exercise and it really comes from the fundamentals of quantum uh, physics that uh, that, that there there are multiple states in which a certain uh, bit can be if it is using quantum principles and therefore the combinatorial power and this really works out if there are combinatorial problems then the combinatorial power of such bits means it can crack much larger problems in much lesser times than what a classical computer do therefore a whole bunch of computational problems may be open to quantum computers did uh, google do something which uh, made uh, did it solve a problem which can't be solved otherwise well again this led to a uh, big big debate and uh, ibm said they had actually said that the ibm supercomputer will do this in x number of years while we are able to do it in 200 seconds ibm said you know that's not that much of a difference we can also do it pretty fast we'll have to pre compute a whole bunch of stuff put it on a hard disk a gigantic hard disk and then we can calculate quite fast now the issue here is not whether google achieved a overwhelming defeat of the ibm supercomputer 
it is that the specifically how you solve the problem can be accelerated also by a classical computer. But the point is that the fact that IBM had to do all these contortions to prove that the Google computer wasn't really that superior means that obviously it had an edge over straightforward calculations we do today. But you come to the Chinese example, the why they should repeat something which Google had already shown, namely quantum supremacy, would by itself have not been that important. But I think the importance of this is not that it is demonstrated a second time, because don't forget, I will still contest Google's argument that they have achieved quantum supremacy. But I think the important part is, apart from quantum supremacy, it also shows that you can use photons as qubits. And that's a huge new ball game opening up for the, for the world. So I think the important part of this is twofold. One, that you can use photons in qubits, and you can, that has been done earlier with small number of photons, but you can do it with a large number of photons. In this particular case, it's 50 to 100 photons were used. Again, there is a range because there is a photon escape and so on. So I'm not, I don't understand it well, neither am I going to go into those details. But I think the important part of it, suddenly it has been shown that one approach is using certain kinds of materials and also near zero temperatures, which is what the Google's quantum computer was based on. And the other possibility is use mirrors uh, uh, and use light to create photonic quantum computers. And that provides a new basis of calculation. And it can be scaled up to the extent of 50 to 100 uh, photons, as uh, the Chinese paper in science talks about. And therefore, a class of calculation which cannot be done by classical computers becomes open to it. Of course, there is one difference between the Google uh, Sycamore computer and the Chinese example that has been presented to us, which is the Sycamore is a more programmable quantum computer. This computer has been created essentially for the problem, the boson sampling problem. So in, in, in that sense, it's a one of a kind competition it is doing. And unless there are some more technological advances, which could happen because it's been shown theoretically they, they could happen, it cannot become an universal quantum computer. But let's face it, even the Google quantum computer hasn't really been used as a, a general purpose quantum computer because there are hard problems we still need to solve, which is what is called error correction and so on. So these are all proof of concept. And I think the Chinese example using for photons is a proof of concept that photons can be used as qubits. And if more advances take place, they can also then be used as programmable quantum computers. But let's face it, whether it is Google, whether, whether it is the Chinese case that we are talking about, or other quantum computers which are in the offing, all of them are at the moment, maybe 10, 15, 20 years away from actual implementation of a universal computer using quantum principles. So I think that this is there, but it is exciting times because we have shown that something which was proposed by Feynman as a, could be used as computers within about uh, 30 years, 35 years is now actually being developed. People are spending huge amounts of money on it. And it seems to be able to solve the class of problems which classical computers may not be able to solve. So then what can we do with, the, with these problems that quantum computers can solve? What does this mean for us in the regular life? What applications do we get from this? You know, because as you said, the Chinese computer was only able to solve one, it was made to solve a particular kind of problem. And we're far from uh, universal general computers. So, that, so what sort of problems do we want these computers to solve? So if we are able to do programmable quantum computers, which I think another given another five, 10 years, we should be able to do both it, because of advance in materials that will take place, the kind of technologies we are dealing with that will take place. All of this is a function of the amount of money we are able to put on it. And if it has functions, 
obviously people will put in the money. So it really depends on what is the expectation from this. So there are two sorts of applications. One I will call the more benevolent the humanitarian kind, advancing science, advancing everyday technology. That is regarding a set of calculations which today our computers cannot do. For instance, a simple thing which is called protein folding. Now, protein folding is very important if you want to do biotechnology, you want to de develop new materials, you want to see its properties, it could also be in drug development. So all of this is, is, is something that we cannot do with classical computers. Protein folding, nature does in a couple of seconds, folds the protein even shorter, but a classical computer would take, you know, a thousand years, 500 years, 200 years to solve such a problem. Of course, Google has made some advances using heuristics, using fast information, and they are able to do using artificial intelligence, as it is called. They have been able to predict protein folding much better than what we thought was possible a few years back. But nevertheless, it's something which is not easy to do in a classical computer. So these are one class of problems which have immediate implication. Then, of course, the other sets of issues which are there is the fact that you can break code. And if you break code, therefore, all the encryption algorithms that we use would then be uh, obsolete. So that, of course, is something which the militaries of the world are very interested in, because if you could do that, they could crack the enemy's code or the, uh, even the friend's code, because you're always trying to steal other stuff from them as well. So in this world of gray and black, white world of uh, spying and surveillance, this would be a huge boon. So of course, that, is, that can be weaponized too. So that is, of course, the second attraction. And the converse of that, you could do quantum uh, information exchange. You could use the principles of this kind also to send, com communicate with, with each other, with yourselves, I mean, your in different entities, different places, which could also provide unbreakable codes. So there is a military application to it. But the civilian administration is really because we are now getting into the area of bio biotechnology in a very big way. And I think the future of the technology lies today in biotechnology and computations. Therefore, quantum computers can provide really in the future huge advances in this direction because that's something that we cannot obviously do with classical computers and therefore we do most of this stuff empirically. So finally, Prameer, the Chinese computer which we were just discussing, it's called Zhu Zhang. Can you tell us what this means? Why, is it, why has it been named so? You know, that's a very interesting history that we are talking about. This is an ancient Chinese text. I think it was found or it has been dated. The What copies we have found is second century AD. And uh, it may go back much further in terms of handwritten copies, which may not be available today. Now, that is uh, basically mathematics in nine chapters. That's really what the title is. The interesting part is it has a different approach to mathematics than what comes in the uh, Greek geometrical approach, which is really problem solving. You state axioms and then you try to solve and the restrictions, you solve it only with straight edge and a compass. So there are various, various kinds of uh, restrictions put on that. It tried to make mathematics as a branch of logic, almost. While when you come to most other places in the world, the approach has been problem solving. How do you solve problems? And Yu Zhang uh, not only provides a set of solutions, how to solve problems, in a general way, but it was considerably in advance of a lot of the mathematics that we saw in the rest of the world. Not all, but some of it was in advance. So some of the principles they talked about are discovered relatively much later. But the interesting part of it, it also has proof. For instance, the Pythagoras theorem has also a proof in this particular example. In China, it's I think called the Gogu theorem. So that is also there, and even the proof is described. So it's not that they were not aware that you know mathematics can be done through proof, it can be done through logic and proof, but their approach was how to solve problems. And this therefore summarizes generalized principles of uh, solving problems. That means also recognizing 
what are the class of problems that we have. Now, this is something which is not unique to the Chinese. There are other uh, civilizations which also did that. Also, we have the, uh, the recently the Bhakshali manuscripts, which were not mathematical manuscripts, they were more manuscripts which are used by essentially business trade trading people who went on trade had to calculate various things. So there were alternate approaches to mathematics. And it's another matter that the Greek one has been sort of elevated to a much higher pedestal because the Europeans would like to believe that they were superior and the superiority comes because the Greeks did something. So interestingly, the Greeks they're talking about, half of them are actually the Anatolian plateau, which is really then Asia, modern day Turkey. But the point is, civilizational terms, that's what they would like to believe, that that's where the West has come from. Therefore, the focus on the Western sources, Du Zhang, in that sense, is also a, a way of talking that it is not just the West that has done all this, that China and other civilizations, in this case, China, because that's why they have named their computer Zhu Zhang. And I think the, is, is what they're trying to say, hey, you know, others have also done mathematics. You're not, it's not only the West, not only the Greeks. And I think that's why they have also named this after this famous mathematical text. Thank you, Prabhu, for talking to us today on this issue. That's all the time we have. Keep watching News Click.